So we're here at IS Entity Water, and I'm joined here by Dr. Steffi Knopp from the Natural History Museum in London. Not a lot of people out there you know, get the point that the NHM are actively, you know, heavily active in terms of actual research within the field of schisto. Um, people go to the museum, they don't realise all this is going on. Steffi, would you like to just, um, in a nutshell, I know you've just given a speech, and thank you for that, but in a nutshell, just describe your work in Zanzibar in terms of, you know. Yeah, what we do in Zanzibar is, um, is a schistosomiasis elimination research project. So the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar is highly committed of walking the last mile towards elimination of schistosomiasis. They've done a very good job over the past decades in trying to reduce the morbidity together with the WHO and the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative in deworming people, children in particular, regularly. And they really decreased the morbidity due to Schistosomiasis, also because of water and sanitation improvement, also because of um, environmental changes. So it might be that certain rivers and ponds do not exist anymore or are just not as used as they used to be, yeah. like in the 1980s or before. And, uh, and nowadays the prevalences of schist got really far down to below 10% and WHO and the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar and other initiatives and institutions really think it is possible that Zanzibar might be the first sub-Saharan place of where urogenital schistosomiasis yeah. can be eliminated. And therefore we do have a trial going on, a randomized intervention trial, where we are assessing the biannual treatment, mm -hmm. but we also try to control the intermediate host snails with mm -hmm. um, applying a molluscy site mm -hmm. to, um, to water bodies at places where humans are in contact with water. So it's not going to the whole pond, but mm -hmm. just used at the time and places where people are actually in contact with water. And then the third arm is the behavior change arm that I was talking about yeah. um, at, at this meeting. And that includes four components, two more school-based educational interactive teaching methods and uh, so-called Kichocho yeah. safe play events, which are uh, Chistosomyces as Kichocho and Kiswahili. Yeah. And then we have the wash or more wash-based community interventions which are washing platforms where people can socialize, um, use safe water and wash their clothes in a safe and social environment and, uh, and we also implement community rhinos mm -hmm. which have been successful in some areas especially when they are more close to, to um, you want to interrupt? Tomas, no, no, you, you're saying the closest. I was going to pick up on that point. Mm. I think that's a vital point. You said earlier in your talk that when the um, washing platform or urinal is closer to the mosque, it seems to be used more. There's more of an uptake. It's looked after. It's more of a focus area. And so I guess I wanted to ask you, in terms of behavior, uh, into behavioral intervention, what more can you have any, is there any more role to play for the mosques, these highly religious communities you're talking about, um, madrasas, mosques, what, can they be leveraged to help this message, this messaging, this behaviour change? Yeah, absolutely, I mean it's, um, it's, uh, it's something which we more and more realised over the, over the now four years of interventions, that, um, that we should definitely not ignore the religious community leaders because they have a highly influential role on the children. They are highly accepted and respected by the communities, by the elder people. They are called in and, um, and with the madrasas, which are the religious school, they have a huge outreach. And madrasa schools are visited not only by the school age children, but actually it's children, I think, from about three years. And up to like adult age, like some madrasa teachers report, they do have students as old as 40, 50 years. And, um, and if you talk with people in Zanzibar, madrasa would be definitely something they have, visit, have been visiting. So, um, and these community or religious leaders have also the wish of supporting the communities. They are proud of being part of an intervention program. They, um, they absolutely appreciate to be included in the intervention, to state their opinions, but also to get the training that other teachers receive to actually be recognized. And um, so, yeah, that, it's absolutely necessary. And mosques, 
for the men in particular play a big role. People yeah. have to do ablution where water is involved. Some mosques are close to ponds or rivers yeah. without a private facility and people would just go to these ponds and rivers and therefore expose themselves like five times a day yeah. to water which is the is transmitted. So using these, as we, as we mentioned before, having these private urinals and shower places, I could call them, uh, for them is, is, is a great benefit and yeah. they appreciate it and they look after them. So yeah, that's absolutely That's, that's yeah. fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm sure from the Natural History Museum's um, perspective, you do a lot of work within the NHM in terms of bringing science to the public. Are there any lessons learned that you could apply in this setting? You know, you talk about leveraging the religious community to get behaviour change underway. Are there any parallels there? Yes, when, when we had the discussion on and, um, in the meeting, mm. we were talking about the upkeep of public toilets. Yeah. And, um, and, and one thing which was asked, could we have a community member looking after the toilets to maintain them better? Mm. And I was just thinking about general public toilets in London with mm. the Lou Tour yesterday yeah. and uh, with the museum but other places as well. Yes, there is a person that looks after these toilets, but that is a person that is paid, that actually has a benefit from doing this. While general public toilets are often not very clean, and I think we cannot just say, oh, people in Africa are not looking after their toilets. Yeah. We were so nice and gave them toilets, why are, not, are they yeah. not looking after them? If you look at public places in general in Europe, it's yeah. Not always ma well maintained, but I'm not talking about the museum toilets. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> but um, and with the public outreach, yeah, you get you get ideas in the museum with these um, uh, science days yeah. that are open to the public, where people ask questions. Um, absolutely, yeah. And I guess what I'm driving at is that we're here we're, with our, one of our mottos at the ISNTD is progress through partnership and you're going to see a wide variety of stakeholders here, potential collaborators, yeah. Yeah? Um, not just the usual NTD crowd, there's a, quite a wide array mm -hmm. of people which here, is fantastic, which yeah. is uh, you know, all credit to them for coming and you know, it's very hearty to see that the cause in terms of this uh, eradication, elimination pathway is being taken up by lots of different people. I guess the question I'm leading to um, is, and it's quite a blunt question, what type of partnerships, collaborations would you like to see from the NHM's perspective in this particular area? Uh, again, I find it hard to, to talk about the NHM perspective, like from my point of view. But what is definitely needed for Zanzibar is people that think from a community perspective of what is needed. I, I, I'm not a fan of just, oh yeah, we're giving you wash, we're giving yeah. you wells, we're giving you taps. And then these taps and wells are there, but they are not in locations that are important for people. Yeah. Or they are not functioning because some taps are they yeah. need electricity and then the yeah. power station doesn't work or whatever. So in general, not as an NHM perspective, but rather from like, yes, there is people needed that support washing platforms, mm. the implementation that, that do give water to people. Um, but it is important to communicate with the local people and not only with the authorities, but really with those that are close to the community and also make really communities to respond and be responsible to, to, um, to what they might achieve and get. It's fascinating to hear this because you know, the world of um, just MDA programs, the top-down MDA mm, programs absolutely. that dominated the space for the last 20, 30 years, you could argue, have had to evolve themselves as the uptake of the, the distributed drug hasn't happened in certain cases or they've moved to a paediatric formulation, which has happened in Shisto mm -hmm. now, and it's a different target group. I know that you said earlier in your talk that you're not aware of the historical use of, or the, uh, how much the levels of Shisto had been in the past to where they are now, but you mentioned something that it's a younger crowd that people are looking at there, yeah? more younger people involved. How will your behavior change approaches, will they have to change? Will, what, what are the steps 
you know, is it a different, totally different approach to the younger generation there, or is it, you know? No, yeah, I think it, it absolutely goes into what you say. What our behavior change approach aims to is not this top-down approach, but the bottom-up thing. And, um, and it's interesting, again, how people appreciate it. Even the teachers, they are usually the ones with the stick in their hand and the learning by heart thing. Um, and now they get a training from the social science behavioral team with, and they, they attend the meetings, they sit there, and they start being bored from the beginning. And then the behavior team starts not the teaching of hey, this is how it is and the typical educational way, but it's an interactive learning. Yeah. And the teachers go out of these trainings and meetings and say, I didn't know that yeah. this learning can be so interesting. And these methods with the flip chart and with the snail boards and with learning like what an, an intermediate host snail looks like. So they, from, from their first training, they do understand the importance of interaction for learning and for understanding. And they really love taking this back to their children, and the children appreciate it as well. Mm. And if you now go to the communities, it's really everybody's aware of this safe play and that you should actually not go to the river. But then what is needed, if people are aware of this, is really alternatives. Mm. And that's exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, if people know what they need, mm. and then they can't use it because it's not working because of no electricity or whatever, yeah. um, it's, yeah, that's. The problem, Rob. Some of the tools involved in behavior change have included, we've seen comics as an example, or you know, messaging through school or through textbooks. Um, what's your opinion of that? Well, my opinion is based on what I hear from people working with the communities. And, uh, and their comics are extremely critically seen because people do not relate, well, at least the people that we met in Zanzibar, yeah. where these comic books, Yuma Nakichocho, Yuma and Shistosomiasis, was distributed, is um, their feedback is really, oh yeah, that's a nice book, but it's not us. Okay. It's a comic figure. Yeah. It's, um, it's not us. And when we designed the flip chart, it was very, very important to use pictures, yeah. photographies of local environment, of local people, even now bringing and uh, thinking about the dissemination of these teaching tools that we use, they really need to be adapted to local communities. So when we go over to mainland Tanzania, we cannot use the pictures from Zanzibar because people in mainland Tanzania would say that's Zanzibar. Yeah. And um, so therefore, again, new pictures from people, they can relate to, like, that's my community, that is my culture. It's extremely important. And these comic strips, it's, um, it seems to work in China and otherwise, where people might have more of a transferable thinking. Yeah. But this is very, very difficult and low in some places in, in Zanzibar where, where it's just like, I mean, people know their village, they know their environment, but there's no transferable thing from TV or from watching comic strips. It might improve now with, um, with all the social media and people having access to that. Yeah. Um, but, but for the beginning and when you hear the, the adults or older people, for sure, it's yeah. comic doesn't work. Doesn't work. That's a very interesting um perspective on it and I suppose what I'm asking you is that you mentioned communities and we're talking in essence about community cohesion in terms of generating behavior change mm -hmm. in quite entrenched religious communities in some cases definitely rural communities closed communities in, in many maybe by province or by tribe in some, certain areas um, I guess the role of science communication is becoming more and more critical in this particular setting and I suppose the question is, how centralised with, with the potential role of someone, a body like the Natural History Museum in terms of science, communication, science communication become in this setting? How important will your role in the future be? Or how important would you like to see the role be? Um, yeah, it's, uh, again, it's an interesting question in terms of how could the museum be like open we are the natural history museum we are engaging into science communication and health i don't like the word health education yeah. let's call it health communication uh, with educational components um, 
I would I would definitely hope so, but it does need like our group working on Chester is a very lab based group. Mm. And then there's people like I knew who really engage more into into communication yeah. and and uh, and the social part of the museum. But it also needs talking between people, and I think that does happen between Anouk and other parts of the museum. But for me, for example, I'm in my little office, and I'm not that much of a communicator. Uh, but it, yeah, it is absolutely. The role, the potential for the role is there. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fascinating to see, and I really wish you well for the future in terms of your work and the, I we feel, the critical role of the, of the pivot between the anthropology and the parasitology, the hard science and the social science. There needs to be a pivot to bring people together. Uh, maybe like a, a, new, a sense of neutrality, and perhaps the museum can provide that. Um, and we wish you all the best for that. And I'd just like to say thank you very, very much. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome, and thank you for your interest and uh, the chance to to promote what we are doing. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Sophie.